Well, welcome to today's Amanita series. It's uh, early October here in Rhode Island. So uh, my favorite time of year is when we have our fly agarics that start to pop up. So first noting that these are rather urban mushrooms and they do like roadways. So please excuse the volume and the uh, background noise that we're gonna be hearing in this video. And uh, we'll get down to it with our fly agarics. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. Ooh doo, doo, doo. So, here we have in the Northeast, we have a Amanita we call Amanita chrysoblema, which is our local regional fly agaric. All right, here we're gonna show you some identification characteristics to this. Yeah. Now, we have this village back here of a, uh, all these Amanita. And I want to note our faithful great white pines that we have here in the Northeast. These look like they were planted at one point. Um, going back to the urbanness that this mushroom has and uh, thrives in, you know, more populated areas and roadways. These pines were planted to border this farm on the other side. And what hitchhiked or found a niche when these saplings were planted? is the Amanita right here. What a lovely relationship for them to have. Uh, this is a lifetime relationship as a mycorrhizal species. Uh, they develop with the trees very young and they continue to envelop the roots of the trees and they have a symbiotic relationship which is very beneficial. So we have some healthy white pines here and some other conifers as well. Um, this species is not specific, uh, host specific on conifers. I have found them under beech before so, duly noted, uh, but typically we find them under conifers, and in this instance, uh, where I find them mostly is with white pines, predominantly unplanted white pines. Now, back to the Amanita. So, we have some smaller ones over here, some buttons. Now let's go over this little shape, how they kind of, they kind of grow. Now, as they pop off the roots, they need to reproduce and pre uh, produce these fruits, so they kind of start off with these eggs with these very bulbous base and then they get the classic rounded cap uh, with the warts as they young and start to s distribute as they get older these buttons are very firm just to let you know it's a very firm mushroom even with the older ones they can be very firm all right now let's collect this little button because this one's a little younger so here we can see the egg and how the at the top of the mushroom kind of pops out, you know, the stem kind of shoots up to produce the agaric form of mushroom that we're familiar with. But noting here, we start to develop uh, rings of this material, this velar material, the universal veil. Um, the same material that's on the warts. But noticed on this, in different stages, we can start to see this material start to distribute a little bit in these little rings and these lines. Classically and typically, we have about three rings on these muscarioids, um, Amanita chrysoblema, that produce. And if we pick this larger one, oh, this is a bad example. This is a bad example, but here we can see some rings. Let's see if we can find it a little more pronounced on these maybe less older ones. All right, so this one's more of an adolescent age approaching maturity and we can see the material on the bottom as it starts to distribute and, and stretch out as it as it matures and grows bigger. And here we can see these rings and see how it kind of leaves like a solid line of material. And as I mentioned, there's three and, and that can vary between, uh, you know, what it rubs up against in meteorological conditions. But we have one, two, three, the classic muscarioid. Um, characteristic going up the stem as well you know separate from section phalloidiae which has fibrils and other sections that we have in amanita these typically have a smooth stem all right this one being so aged in maturity is a little waterlogged and sogged out she feels a little heavy and i can notice as i'm kind of rubbing against the stem you can see this discoloration now for edibility reasons or collections you know i will mention in this is that something like this as pristine as this looks, this is really 
use that truck. This one's really waterlogged and sogged out, and we can even see in the inside, there's a lot of bug damage that we have in here. So this one we really want to discard. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, back that to our other Amanita. Let's go over some more characteristics. All right. So, we have the base that it pops out with. With the classic rings of material that it starts to go. And we can slowly go up the stem, rather smooth. We do see some fibrils, but not pronounced as in other sections. And then we have the skirt. These are classically characterized by having a skirt. This one's a little older and is a flop down on the stem. And then we have the gills. And then we have all these little warts on the cap. Noting on Amanita chrysoblema, they typically start off yellow. As with these ones, they can also take tones of orange. In red, even in extreme cases, um, I find our late season cold weather flushes. We get a few flushes of these every year. Um, we'll even have this really darkish peachy red kind of tones to it. So this one's orange. And if we can see as they fade, they may take these gold colors. They may wash out and come completely white. And often you have this sunny side egg kind of look. You know, the original color is still at the disc over here. Noting the distribution of the vellum and the, the warts, the universal veil that, that, that distributes on it, you know, generally has a pattern. Pattern's not really specific for Amanita muscaria, but something I note on this, um, in this flush in particular, it's rather flat and patchy and no real rhyme or reason on how it's patched out. I like to think of these as islands on a map that I'm looking at. And often I get lost trying to pretend to be a little ship sailing in the waters of the Pelico around all these warts, you know, and the different shapes it, it, you know, it grows into. Just a little fun. Anyways, we do have this striate margin that we have on the cap, which is characteristic to section Amanita overall, but noted on these muscarioids, uh, Amanita chrysoblema. Now let's see what else we have for identification characteristics. We talked about the size. We talked about the host. We talked about some of the developing factors and characteristics that it uh, maintains. Oh, the short gills. Here we have short gills. Amanita can really be helped classified by noticing the distribution of the gills. And we have gills that go from the edge of the pellicle all the way to the apex of the stem. And we'll also notice a lot of these short gills. Now these are truncate and they give this appearance of the absence, these little tiny triangles. Well, here we can see their distributed lengths are uh, vary, and these are rather pronounced and abundant uh, in regards to Amanita, but we also have this shape. And the shape, which is characteristic to this section, uh, and Amanita chrysoblema in particular, we call truncate. All right, well, let's see if we can find a truncate member. All right trying to zoom in on the characteristics. So just below my thumb, if you follow it down where I'm stretching it, you see the design and the shape of the short gill. It's not rounded, it's not toothed, doesn't come to a point, kind of stops off squarely. And we refer to this as truncate, very similar to how we refer to uh, leaves on trees and their shapes. Now, with biology, we use a lot of fancy science terms. And yeah, short gills might finish our Amanita series today with these Amanita chrysoblema. And I do want to wish everybody a happy season um, and happy harvest as we enter Artem, uh, one of my most favorite times of year we have in Rhode Island. I hope you enjoyed. Well, in addition with the Amanita Chrysoblema identification bit, I do want to mention that a lot of these trees, especially this time of year, a lot of the fungus that are symbiotic with them start to get activated. So worth a mention, especially when regards to toxicity, toxicity and consumption, um, that we will have other members that may grow side by side between these. One noted here, I do want to mention, side by side with Amanita chrysoblema is that we'll find Amanita crenulata, okay? Crenulata, we have other videos that discuss this, but noted I mentioned those 
rings that Amanita Crystal Blemma has of the velar material at the base of the stipe. We don't see that on Amanita Crenolata. This is called the Poison Champagne Amanita. Uh, it's in the same section and contains the same toxins. In my experiences, they are a lot stronger than Amanita Muscara, um, Crystal Blemma. <laughs> I'm still catching myself doing that. Uh, but worth noting, um, as a collector's point of view, I actually consume all of these. But worth noting on these, you know, they have variants in appearance, especially noted as a base with all Amanita, and it has this much more dusty velar material on the cap, um, which is easily wiped away. Uh, you didn't see my finger there. But also noting a lot of these other species I mentioned, you know, we have our flushes of Lacaria lacata that like the same time of year. And even over here, we have a few late season blushers that pop up. All right. And our Sue Willis as well. A variety of uh, bow leaves will pop up at the same time of year. Like I said, once the cold weather and the water hits these white pines, um, a lot of these species get activated and it's their time to reproduce. And just to finish and conclude this, we do have some chonky, chonky Amanita. This is Amanita chrysoblema. For any of those that, you know, want to use color variants as a, maybe it's technical, maybe it's not. I don't really find the need, but classically we'll find our pure white in appearance, even at button stage, um, which coincides with the original description of chrysoblema. Um, it's a little touchy subject right now, being kind of a new name that we're using, but I did want to point out is that just because we have different colors, this is the same set of trees and varying on, uh, you know, how the mushroom wants to produce. They come in various forms. So that's it for today. I hope you all enjoyed. Adding on a little again to uh, the Amanita Crystal Blema segment of identification, I mentioned that there's uh, Variation in the pigmentation uh, between these regionally um, or between hosts, even in the same regions. Uh, we have yellow, we have red, we have white variants uh, that we discuss. Uh, I'm not a fan of using them because here in New England and Rhode Island, honestly, I find them in all sorts of different shapes and forms. You know, here we have our classic yellow, maybe a little bit of red still on the top, uh, Amanita Crystal Blemma. And right next door, we have our more peachy red variation, uh, if you want to consider it a variation. They're all the same species. Going back up the hill here, we go back into red. And even going down here, we have our white variant, uh, which we featured those chunky guys before, um, how they just grow with these pigmentations. So even between the same host trees and the same species, we have this variation between these same flushes. Well, something I want y'all to think about when it comes to pigmentation of these mushrooms uh, for Amanita chrysoblema. So variants, but they are indeed all the same species. I hope you enjoyed.